<laughs> oh, I'm on. I can tell. Uh, I'm hot. Woo! Whew. Steaming in here. <laughs> Made me forget where I was at. How often do we realize the debt of love? How often are we grateful for the things that God has given us? You know, sometimes it's easy to take it all for granted. Just kind of, I just go about my daily life. Kind of look at the things that I want and, and want the world to bend around me. But where I left off was, it has a tendency to come back and roost on us. It has a tendency to come back and, uh, well, not, uh, let me take that back. It doesn't have a tendency. God has a way of bringing it all back around. It will eventually come back in your life. And those are some difficult lessons. Uh, met with a friend yesterday for Friday, about three hours, talking about uh, not a fan and being a follower or a fan. That's a study the men are doing. And the question is, what are you, a fan? You know, when the going's good and the, the, the team is winning, ha, yeah, man, I'm all excited. You know, and when, boy, when the team's not winning and when things aren't going the way I want them to go, then I'm all down in the dumps. It's kind of interesting when you look at things and then you start, you're looking at writing a sermon and you find these things all fitting together, that they just seem to are there over and over. It's the theme of life. It's the theme of the life for the Christian. It is this backward, forward motion. Um, uh, and so uh, we were talking in the men's, and I talked to this friend because he has a problem with the, the end of the book. And, and he, I said, Joe, the, the thing is, is we, it's kind of a fluid position. We become a fan, and sometimes we're really strong followers. And then it seems like we become a fan. Things aren't working the way we want. And, and we kind of move back and forth. And it's like the Pilgrim's Progress, if you've ever read it. And if not, read it. Because that's the life of Christian. And that's who the story's about, Christian, and, and his progress to the eternal city. And boy, he's got some ups and downs uh, along the way. He gets to one place, and it's called the Pool of Despondency. You ever felt despondent? I see a couple of nods, and now we don't want to admit it, do we? Not too awful much. Hey, go ahead and admit it. Because you know what? That's life. It's life. We get to that places where we feel despondent. You know, we wonder, God, where are you at? Or is God there at all? Or the other part of that, does God really care? Man, I want you to think as we look at this part of Jacob's life. I was going to skip over this and kind of, you know, try to move a little quicker. <laughs> and every time I think about doing that, it seems like God says, well, I want you to read this first before you think about that. And then it's like, oh, Boy, there's some pretty good lessons here, I guess. Okay, Lord. So, Genesis chapter 29. And uh, we'll get to look at Galatians 6, verse 7 later on, but uh, because it relates to uh, Genesis uh, 29. Let's stand in honor of God and His Word. And it's a lengthy, bit of a lengthy chapter, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. We'll be picking it up as we go on in the message. Then Jacob went on his journey. Now, you remember what happened just before he went on his journey? Uh, now, this is not that he got thrown out of his dad's house, had to leave because he was a fool and, and the way he treated his brother and, and all that. That happened in 28, but then he, he's on the journey. He's got to go because Esau wants to kill him. <clears throat> You've stole my birthright. You've stole the blessing. And he just <clears throat> can't wait for his father to die so he can take out his revenge. I'm going to get even and I'm going to uh, kill my brother to find my comfort. I have water up here. It's just caught. <clears throat> And so he stops at Bethel. He's wore out. It's a three-day journey to Bethel. And he lays down, puts a rock under his head to safety, not a pillow. I've never had a pillow for a rock. And I've had a couple of pillows that felt like rocks. Uh, and, you know, and it was just for protection, really. He goes to sleep, and he has a vision from God. 
And the vision is this ladder from heaven. And so he has that vision, and then you pick it up at 29, and then, after the vision from God, then he goes on his journey once again uh, to the sons of the east. And he looked up, and he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it. From the well, far or for from the well, they watered the flocks. Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would then roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in place on the mouth of the well. And Jacob said to, the, said to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. And he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Naor? And they said, We know him. And he said to them, Is it well with him? And they said, It is well. These guys have some deep conversations. <laughs> And, and behold, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. And he said, Behold, it's still high day. Is it not time for livestock to be gathered, water the sheep, and go pasture them? And they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered, and they roll the stone from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came in her father's sheep with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came about when Jacob saw the daughter, uh, saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And then and <clears throat> Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her. Uh, father and that he was Rebekah's son and she ran and told her father and so it came about when Laban heard the news of Jacob his sister's son that he ran to him to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him into the house and then he related to Laban all the things and Laban said to him surely you are bone of my bone and my flesh and he stayed with him for a month our father and God um, open up your word to us Help us to, Lord, not just uh, skim over it. Help us not to close our ears to it. But, Lord, uh, help us to hear it's you speaking to us. Lord, hide me behind the cross that not my dry throat or, or lack of eloquence would interfere with grasping your word. Speak to us, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So Jacob's fleeing his brother, and, and he's moving on. He has this vision. And in Genesis twenty eight fifteen, 15, uh, God speaks to him, and he makes this declaration. And so look at that for a moment. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And that vision was wrongly called Jacob's Ladder. We even have a song in the hymnal, Jacob's Ladder. And I thought about that, and I thought a lot, Jacob's Ladder. Oh, man, Jacob, he built the ladder to heaven. He built the ladder because the, the angels were stuck in heaven. They couldn't get down to minister to him. And God was stuck up there and he had to build. And you know what I realized? Uh, we have wrongly named this thing. We've wrongly named it Jacob's ladder because in reality, it's not Jacob's ladder. It's heaven's ladder. And is God's ladder, but it surely is not Jacob's ladder. But what did it mean? Well, the vision, <coughs> followed by God's comment, were to cement in his mind. Think about this and, and ask yourself, is this cemented in your mind? That wherever he went, wherever he went, the ladder went, and every place that he went, therefore, was the house of God in the gate of heaven. Boy, think about the ramifications of that for your and my life. See, it goes right along with Psalms 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Can I hide all the things we do in dark that we think, oh, nobody's going to know, nobody's going to see me, nobody's going to get a clue on this, and we think, boy, I've gotten away with something, or however you want to put that into your terms. But you can't get away from God. He sees it all. He sees every bit of it, and that's some of the shame and some of the guilt that I live with from my past. As a boy, and I have sleepless nights, my past, it tends to come up, and it, it will sometimes just really weigh heavy on my heart. And I talk to the Lord, and I thank Him that He forgave me my past, that I can move forward, and that it's the flesh and the evil one that would bring that up. 
So God is trying to cement in his mind. In, in practical term, that ladder symbolizes God's care. You get that? The ladder symbolizes God's care and God's providential <clears throat> directing of all of life. Man, God is, even uh, in our screw-ups, God is still directing our lives. God's still working in the midst of all the foolish things that we might do. And, and that's the point here, because it's not just to Jacob, it's to every believer. And where do I see that? Romans eight twenty eight, For God will cause all things to work together for the good of those who love him, that are called according to his purpose. And now if you're like me, and you hear that verse, you say, oh, pshh. Wait a minute, what about that stupid thing or that bad thing that happened? What, what about that person that treated me so miserably? What about the self-loathing that I have? If you don't know what that means, it means you don't like yourself very much. Been there a few times in my past. You see, those are the kinds of things, man, that come. And Paul's saying, yeah, God can even take those things and, and he will work good out of them. What? It doesn't feel so good when I go through it. No, it didn't say it's going to feel good when you go through it. But what it says is that God's going to take that, and hopefully you will learn a lesson. My dad, who had a third-grade education, said to me, because uh, you know, I, I had a tendency to get into trouble, and he said, Sonny boy, learn from your mistakes. There's always a lesson to learn. Always a lesson, and turn it to good. So it might have had a negative experience, and, and the, the consequence could have been negative, but turn that around and learn from it. And, and that's the point I think that we so often miss when we try to say, oh, God, oh, he's working everything for the good. Woo-hoo! And, but it's not so woo in the middle of it, is it? It kind of weighs us down. This is a, a God uh, of ours is not, is not simply a God of miracles uh, who occasionally injects power into individuals' lives. He, may, he is far greater than that, but he maintains and he directs all of life to suit and to affect his purposes. His purposes. God's got a purpose for each of our lives here. He wishes we would get a hold of it and, and, and would trust him and believe that and then walk with him and, and watch how he's going to work these things out. But we tend to want to do it on our own so often. But he doesn't always interrupt the natural order of things. Sometimes he lets that natural order take place, but then he comes in and brings good out of that, hopefully by us learning some lessons of life. The angels coming and going on that ladder is a picture of God being there. That God being available and God working in all facets of our life. That's the picture. That God is working in every facet of your life. So lay your life out before him. Lay it out. Write it out on paper. Do a timeline. I was born here. Some of us, that takes too long. So <laughs> too many years have gone by. But you young folks, do a timeline of your life. And, and, and look, where has God been? Where's family been? Where, what have been the ups and downs? Start writing them in. And then, then after you've done that, then go back and look where God has been working in your life. Man, that's an amazing feat to do. Uh, you will see some things that I believe will surprise you, and I believe will encourage you. But the thing about Jacob, uh, knowledge that the ladder of God's presence and provision was with him does not suggest that uh, his faith was complete. It would be good if it was complete, but it doesn't suggest that because we're going to find out it's not. And we're going to find out he wavers again and he struggles. He misses a lot of things. It takes him a while to get a clue, just like you and I. Uh, the old scheming Jacob, he was still alive. That schemer was still in him. It, it hadn't been taken out yet. He hadn't totally submitted it yet. And, and it's going to raise its ugly head with Uncle Laban once again. So, like all of us, he was a piece of work, and yet he's a piece of work in progress. You know, you're a piece of work, bud. <laughs> but I'm so glad that you say, yeah, I am, but I'm a piece of work in progress. God has not given up on me. God hadn't given up on him. And I hope that's some of the things that we will see as we look at his life. Because his life is a life of ongoing education. It's ongoing, and it's working to complete him, to make him who, who he's supposed to be, the head of the 12 tribes of Israel, the prince of Israel, the one that the covenant blessings are going to go to the rest of the world. He's not there yet. He is not there yet, but God has not given up. 
So let's take this apart. Verses 1 through 8, Jacob arrives at Haran. Man, his hope is energized. Imagine he had that, the vision of the ladder, and God said, you know, I'm going to be with you, and, and man, that's pretty cool. You know, you can't tell me if you heard in the middle of the night somebody woke you up, yo, fool, oh, <laughs> hey, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you in all the things that you're going to experience in life. I'm going to be there. Man, it was like, wow, we'd be pretty energized. Man, God's going to be there. But you know what happens after that, after God speaks? Testing. <laughs> There's always some test that comes along to see if we really believe it and, and how we're going to respond to it. So Jacob hoped to get energized by, by his latter vision because he goes on the journey. He doesn't stay there at Bethel. Well, man, God's here. I better stay here. No, man, that was an experience with God. Now God's going to go with me. He's going to take me to another place. And so he travels on to Mesopotamia. And I'm sure Jacob knew the story about his mother, Rebecca, and how uh, his dad, his, uh, dad or granddad sent Eleazar to go to his homeland to find a wife for his son. Man, I'm sure he knew that story and, and knew that, boy, there's some deal about a well and Eleazar hearing from God. Uh, so his, I think his expectation when he seen that well and kind of had an idea where he was by this time, I think his expectations, whoa, God is with me. Yeah, baby, here I am. And, and he's just all excited about life at that moment. <clears throat> Would God now be able to uh, be pleasing him with the answers to all those promises that he gave? And there's, three, there's these three flocks of sheep. And they're sitting around, and it's about midday. Now, they should be watering them sheep. They should be then getting them off to pasture. And, and these guys, they don't even say hi to him. You ever have that happen? You go to some place, and you feel like everybody's ignored you? Yeesh, that's not a lot of fun. But Jacob's kind of gotten bold. Why did he get bold? Because God's with him. God gave him a vision, and he spoke to him. But then you, get, and you look at verses uh, 4. And Jacob said to them, my brothers, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. Boy, that excited him. Yeah, man, that's where my family's from. That's my relatives there. <clears throat> Do you know Laban, the son of Naor? And they said, well, we know him. Few words, folks. And he said to them, it is, is it well with him? And they said, it is well. And here's Rachel, his daughter, coming with his sheep. And, and as we can see in verse 7, they still make no effort to move the stone to water the sheep. And here comes Rachel, and she's going to water him. And, you know, Jacob, he's getting kind of, whoa, man, she's a good-looking girl, man. And she's family. And she's got her sheep. He wants to help her out. And then he'd like to get these guys out of the way, probably, so he could talk to them. And so he confronts these idle shepherds. Verse 7, Behold, it is still day. Is it not time for the livestock to be gathered, water the sheep, and go pasture them? The implication is, it's midday, and you should have watered the flock and get them grazing and fattening them up, you lazy bunch of fools. That's what's behind those words. And it must have stung them. <clears throat> and, and they managed to give up a defense in verse 8. We cannot, you know, just feeble attempts. Man, we cannot until all the sheep are gathered. You know, when all them sheep are gathered, it's going to take a long time to water them. But there's a big old heavy stone. He said, I don't think they wanted to try to move it. They, maybe they felt inadequate. And are gathered together, and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Uh, then we water the sheep. You know, uh, but they kind of blow it, and they, they're not doing it. So Jacob meets his family. That's the next point down. And it's Rachel. And while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was, verse 9, a shepherdess. Aware now that she's uh, not only attractive, but she's relative. Uh, and, and Jacob does what the shepherds had refused to do. Verse 10, the second part of that, and verse 11. Now, this is a big old stone. It took a number of people to roll it away. You're talking about he is on, Chris's terminology, the jazz. He is pumped up, man. It's like he'd been lifting weights, and he is ready to take it all on. And verse uh 10 uh, B, he went, went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flocks of Laban, his mother's brother. And then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice and wept. The, the text makes it uh, clear that removing the stone, man, that took some strength. 
That stone was, that was over there to keep uh, contaminants out of the water. These other shepherds had him moved it. They, it sounds like they needed others to help him along. But he goes <clears throat> with a burst of energy, pushes that thing away, and, and it seems that after meeting the Lord, he had grown into a man. Man, he was full of strength. Jacob waters the flocks first. It would have taken some time because of the restricted source. But when the last of the sheep was satisfied, he kisses his cousin and wept out loud. And that is not a kiss of intimacy, of sexual desire or anything. Man, it is a kiss of friendship, of being a family member. Man, he has just been on his own. He doesn't know what's ahead of him. And here God is provided immediately by a well, a family member, and in his excitement, and he, it's a custom that he would kiss her. It's the first time in the Bible, in one of the only places, that a man kisses a woman, not his wife or his betrothed. Jacob, no doubt, saw this as the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise that he had made to him at Bethel. But did you notice there's something missing here? Did you notice anything missing? I read this a couple of different times, and I went back to read about Eleazar. And what I found that there, there's no mention of prayer. You don't find any mention of Jacob praying. You find no mention of worship. It's kind of like, well, you know, God made this promise, and, and God's going to do the work, but there's no then giving thanks back to God. Oh, folks, we can live there way too often. We take for often so for granted so often what God has done in our lives, and and, and then we get this. Sometimes we get a haughty attitude about it. At, at each moment, the servant and Abra, of Abraham, Eleazar, he prayed and he worshipped, and he fell before Laban over and over and prayed and worshipped and gave thanks to God for what he had done. And you wonder if the lack of prayer has something to do with the next part of the story that's going to take place with Laban. You, just, you, you wonder that. I do. Uh, I, I hope what we learn from that little bit is the importance of prayer. The importance of having an attitude of gratitude. You know, I mean, that's what Scripture says, to have an attitude of gratitude, be thankful for all things. Are you thankful? Well, I don't like the way my life is. Thank God you got a life. Hey, whoa, that's a big deal. My older sister, I got a call Friday while I'm meeting with this other friend, and my nephew calls and says, uh, I can't talk real long, and I'm meeting with somebody, and he said, uh, Mom's in the hospital. They took her from the doctor's office and said that she had to go to the emergency room right away, and she is now in cardiac care unit. It's like, whoa, you know, you still got life. And, and you young folks got a long life ahead of you. You know, some of us are on that downward side, you know. Yeah, we passed the, the middle of the road. <laughs> but you know what? It's still all uphill with the Lord. It's all uphill. Uncle Laban, the schemer. Verse 12b and, and 14. Uh, Rachel, of course, is astounded. Look what it says. She ran, told her father, and as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, boy, he got excited. You got to wonder about that. His sister suddenly ran to meet him. He embraced him, kissed him, and brought him into the house. And then Jacob tells Laban all the things. Man, I think I had left a whole bunch out, man. I wonder, did he tell him about how he stole his brother's birthright? Did he tell them how he deceived his brother? You, you just wonder because of what's going to happen to him. You know, Laban's no fool, but he also knows that, hey, I'm not going to get any wealth out of this guy. He didn't come with a caravan. doesn't say anything about a caravan, does it? It doesn't say that he had a bunch of gifts to give, because there's no gift of giving here. It seems like when he left home, man, he was beat footing it real fast because Esau was hot on his trail, and he was worried about that. And, and so he he's, takes off. And Laban kisses him, gives him all that, uh, but then... Man, there's nothing that Jacob has to offer. And I wonder if Laban realized that now Jacob is at his mercy and he is highly exploitable because he had nothing. He, he's just here on his own. From Jacob's perspective, the vision of the ladder and his promise of protection and provision Man, it stood high over his life. God was directing the commerce from uh, heaven on his behalf. Uh, the gate of heaven, man, it stood open over his life. And that's a fact. It did. That, that was true. And it would remain open, but not as he expected. 
You see, the gate of heaven's open, but it's not always the way we expect. Jesus came, and it wasn't the way the Pharisees and the scribes expected. They wanted it their way. And when it didn't happen their way, they missed Jesus altogether. And sometimes God's working in our lives, and we are so upset about life that we miss God altogether. He needed some growth. He needed to experience some of the pain that he had inflicted on others uh, to help him develop a heart of compassion. He didn't have that. He was like my dad said to me, a mouthful of gimme and a handful of take. You know, gimme, 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 take, take, take. I want what I want when I want it. And he needed to learn some humility because he didn't have that yet. And adding it up, Jacob needed the depth of character. You see, that was missing in his life. He didn't have that. He needed to grow in his faith. And for him to mature, he needed to stop trusting himself. Boy, there's a big point for all of us. He needed to stop trusting himself and to lean wholeheartedly on God. So we have in verses 15 through 13, Jacob is deceived. Uh, First part we see is seven years for Rachel. uh, Verse 15, Uncle Laban slyly raised the subject of wages. And it sounds like, well, you know, I'm going to help out my nephew here. And, And it sounds like he's being generous. But and an attentive reading, it indicates that there was an impetus behind that from his deceitful heart. Look at verse 15. Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall I, uh, your wages be? Laban's introduction of the subject was followed by an anonymous revelation. Verse 16, Now Laban had two daughters. <laughs> Boy, that ain't going to really come to play. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. And Jacob loved Rachel. The older sibling conflict uh, introduces uh, here that ominous conjuring up of misery between Jacob and Esau. The older and the younger, and it, it brings that back to light. Jacob's past, I think it's catching up with him. The the fact that he abused his brother, that he stole from his brother, uh, didn't seek God out in God's ways, did it his own way. I think it's coming back, and he's got to face it. You see, he has to face himself and what he has done, as well as face God. And it does comes back with the vengeance. Leah's weak eyes most likely meant that she had no fire, no sparkle, no pizzazz. You ever see people that have lost the sparkle and the pizzazz? You look in their eyes, and you see emptiness and it always pains my heart when i i see people with empty eyes uh, because you know the internal conflict that they're going through at that time and and boy in the middle east man that was not a prized thing for a person to lack pizzazz and sparkle in their life rachel on the other hand she's a knockout in jacob's estimation uh it doesn't necessarily mean that she was beautiful by the world standards you know she's some top supermodel and and all that doesn't know that would be a wrong impression in them days in them days uh it more likely meant that she uh was strong boned and stout she was a shepherdess and she could handle the sheep remember what shepherds had to do they had to protect the sheep so you get the impression that, yes, she was beautiful, especially in his eyes, but she was very capable as well. Whereas Leah, she's weak-eyed and, and, and can't see very well, can't doesn't take care of herself maybe as much. Uh, <clears throat> most uh, ominously, we're told that Jacob loved Rachel, and, and what a love it was. Man, he offered uh, to serve for seven years, man, to indenture myself. That means I am going to be your slave for seven years. It's not even an employee. He was indenturing himself to pay this debt off. So he would be an indentured slave at that time. And, and uh, boy, at the end of seven years, then he would get uh, Rachel for a wife. The normal dowry, was, was what he offered the, that seven years, was at least double what the normal dowry would have been at that time. Man, he was offering an incredible uh, lot. But maybe it also speaks to the fact that he didn't go with any riches that he could afford to pay for her. So, you know, I mean, that's the other side of the stone there. Uh, But such love. Verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days. That's what love's like. Man, I could do anything, man. I'm so in love. You just, you push and you do it all. 
work like a dog to provide and you know <laughs> and, and you do all the nice little things that's the picture you have and verse uh next part verse 21 the deceiver gets deceived it indicates that Laban was holding out as much as he could from Jacob. So verse 21, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is complete. Laban had known that time was complete, but he doesn't want to give in. He's eight. Hey, he's got a free worker here. Why not keep him? Why not stretch this thing out? Laban appears to comply. He gathers all the people together in verse 22, and he has a wedding feast. And at the end of the first day's festivities, uh, the groom wraps his cloak around his bride, and, and he takes her in his tent to consummate the marriage. And, and following that was continued six days of uh, celebration. Evidently, Laban uh, used the veiling of the bride uh, in the lateness of the hour and probably a little too much wine and uh, Jacob wasn't uh, seeing very clearly thinking very clearly and he takes the bride that uh, Laban gives him and uh, boy you got to also look at Leah here she was willing uh, or not uh, well yeah Leah was willing to go along with it but what about Rachel she either was willing or got taken out of the picture we don't know but Leah had to surely be willing to go along with this whole scheme Oh, the tangled web that we weave when first we try and decide to deceive. And that's the reality of what happens here. And can you imagine the shock on Jacob when he awoke the next morning and gazed over upon his beautiful wife? <laughs> Who are you? Man, I, we don't know what he said to her. But I cannot imagine it was a whole lot of very nice things. Uh, yeah, but, and, you know, he'd been whispering Rachel's name all night long, and Leah, she'd been playing the part and acting like it's Rachel. And that, that just amazes me. Kind of a real life soap opera here. Leah was now his wife, though. He, she was his wife, and there was no reversing of the consummation of the marriage. Couldn't reverse this. It is a done deal, buddy. You are stuck. There's no if, ands, or buts. Oh, the betrayal, the hurt, the anger. And, and Jacob faced Laban, verse 25b. What is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why have you deceived me? Oh, boy, how our words will come back to bite us and to haunt us. I wonder if he heard the irony of his own words. Do you hear the irony of his words? Boy, that verb deceived, that is the same uh, stem that is used for Jacob's deception of Esau. The same verb stem that was used there when he stole Esau's blessing. At last, boy, I think Jacob is beginning to understand that he is on the receiving end. Oh, well, folks, uh, you know, kids, if I could ever tell you, life does come around. Man, and you know, I, I don't... Behold karma and all those other things. But man, the way we treat others will come back and will be the way we get treated. It, we, we will be treated the same way. God's word bears that out. The way we judge others, that's the way we will be judged. The way we treat them is the way we wind up getting treated. And, and you know what? Jacob never thought of this stuff. He, I don't think he thought of that when he was deceiving his brother and taking the blessing for a bowl of stew or, or the uh, birthright or when he uh, went along with his mom's plan to get the blessing. I don't think he put much thought into life. And, and you know what? I, I know sometimes young people get tired of hearing that. Man, I wish I had heard it. I wish I had paid a little bit more attention to some of the things that my dad uh, had taught me or tried to teach me, I should say. Uh, but then life taught me because then I paid the consequences. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, the consequences weren't always fun. If anything, his agony and his outrage exceeded that of Esau because Esau had a negligible reward for his birthright uh, or, or negligible regard for his birthright. Jacob did not have negligible regard for Rachel. He loved Rachel. He desired Rachel. He worked seven years to have her for a wife. Man, it is not negligible. He is intensely angry about this whole situation. And maybe he understood just a, a, a little bit of what he did to his brother. Maybe. Laban's self-righteous dig further uh, ex in extortion was intended to cut Jacob to the quick, and it does, verse 26 and 27. Is, 
It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of, with this, of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. And there's yet another jab, because what he did to Esau as he was the younger, he did to the older. And it's not done, it's not done in this country here that, that we give the younger before the older. The older's got to go first. It would be an insult to the family, an insult to the oldest child, daughter, to let the younger daughter get married. So, hey, isn't that what you do in your own country? And there's the dig, you know, just what you did to your brother. And so uh, he's beaten into silence. He loves this woman. He wants her. And he doesn't have, what's it, how can he respond? He's stuck. And so what does he do? Hey, he wanted her. He, he, cared, he really cared for her, and he agreed to the contract, to re- and he receives Rachel at the end of the six days. He didn't have to wait another seven years. He got her at the end of the celebration time, and, and then he had to work off that seven years. So, and, and Laban, he's a nice guy. He sends their two servants with him. Oh, boy, just another part of the tangled web that gets wove, because these two women become concubines of him. His life is messed up. And God still loves him. God still is with him. God still has a ladder from heaven to him. God is still working in his life, even though you don't find him talking to God, you don't find him praying. You see, God does not give up on his people. And no matter what you're experiencing, you know, well, pastor, you're going to have another surgery, man. Why is God allowed to hate? Some doctor needs me to share with him. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I talk to the, the hospital and they, and they ask that, well, you seem like you're excited to have a surgery. I would have to have a hole in my head to be excited for surgery. I'm excited to get my arm fixed, but I'm excited because I know God's got a plan. Uh, and so I just kind of let those things go. God, whatever you want to do, go ahead and do it. Uh, I just want to be with you and serve you. So, verse 28, Jacob did, did so, completed his week. Then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant, uh, Bilu, B, uh, Bilha, to his daughter, Rachel, and to be her servant. And so Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban another seven years. Boy, there's a tough phrase, isn't it? He loved Rachel more than Leah. Man, the pain... The pain. You see, that kind of goes back to his family life, too. His mom loved Jacob more than she loved Esau, and his dad loved Esau more than he loved Jacob. And man, you got all kinds of family conflicts, and then you had family division, and you got a lot of pain in life. Talk about a recipe for misery, though. One was loved and favored, and the other one was unloved and less favored. And on top of all that, then there's the maids and the, and the concubines that they become. Uh, two weeks earlier, Jacob was unmarried. Just two weeks earlier, this guy is unmarried. And now yeah, he's indentured for 14 years. He's got four wives. Uh, where is God? Where is God? Why is God allowing all this stuff to happen? Had God pulled up the ladder from heaven and said, Bam, baby, you're on your own, man. I, I, I'm done with you. And God didn't do that, did he? God was still there. God was still wanting to help him. But we don't have that communication with God. Man, if you get nothing out of today's message, nothing else out of it, pick on the point that you need to talk to God. Then I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how bad it is. Uh, it, it might seem the worst thing in the world right now. God's there. Uh, the point that we have to ask is, God, Help me to see my way through this. Strengthen me. Help me to go beyond where I'm at right now to see your hand. You know, the song, new song sings. Boy, that's an old group. They're still out there, but when they first wrote this, it was 25 years ago. (laughs) When you don't know his plan, when you can't see his hand, trust his heart. Trust his heart. You see, that, that, is, that was just a, you know, a few words in a song, but the message is a life message. you got to trust God's heart. God was right there as he had promised. He hadn't left him. Then why the trouble? Well, Numbers, it's up on the wall, 32, 23. We don't like this verse too much. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sins will find you out. <laughs> don't like that verse. 
And I was trying to hide them sins from God. Can't hide them from God. So what do you do with them? Don't raise your hand. But if you've sinned, if somebody in here has sinned, what do you do with it? Well, the Word tells us, confess our sins. He's faithful and just. He will forgive us for all our sins. But don't just give God lip service and go back and do the same thing. Change what you've been doing. You know, I have people that call me for uh, family counseling and marriage counseling. And I've said this before, you know, I could tell you what to do in a heartbeat. I could tell you how to fix your problem. Just don't do the things that you've been doing. <laughs> do different. If you've been acting like an idiot, don't act like an idiot. If you've not been talking, talk. If you've been selfish, quit being selfish. You know, kind of like the skit that the guys so uh, well did at the uh, agape room. Just stop it. <laughs> I love that little skit. It was great. But, but that's the reality, see? Just don't do those things. But that is easy to say and so hard to do. And that's where God comes into play. I take it to God. The providence of God working in everyday life uh, was in full effect in Jacob's life. Full effect. Only thing, Jacob couldn't see it. God's full effect is working in your life. Open your eyes. We sing that song, Open my eyes that I might see. Open your eyes. Look where God's at. Romans 8, 28, Amplified Version Translation. Amplified helps to explain it a little bit more. We are assured and know that, parentheses, God being a partner in their labor. I like that, a partner in your labor. All things work together and are fitting into his plan for a good uh, for the good to those who love God and who are called according to his design and purpose. That, that was an incredible verse, but if you went, it helps to explain that. Boy, God's a partner with you. He was a partner with Jacob, but Jacob just didn't get it yet. And, and he had to go through life experiences to get there. I hadn't gotten it yet. All those things my dad said to me as a kid, and I thought... <sighs> Mark Twain did a great thing. He said, boy, when I was 14, I realized my dad was such a fool and didn't know anything. Chris is kind of trying to quote Mark Twain. He said, but when I turned 21, I was shocked at how much the old man had grown in seven years. <laughs> my dad was the same old dad. <laughs> you know who grew? Yeah, me. I started to grow. There's some interesting points here, folks. <laughs> I, I, as I... Yeah, I never gave any thought to this before. And all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, think about this. There was 12 sons born to, to Jacob, right? Uh, and, and so uh, the unloved Leah and her maid, uh, Zilpah, eight of the 12 tribes of Israel were born to them. And the unloved Leah. I want you to see God working here. Don't, don't miss it. It's just too important to miss. Leah would be the mother of Reuben, Simon, Levi, Judah, Iskar, and Zebulon. The men of Issachar understood the times and they knew what to do. Whoa. What does that tell you? They're pretty sharp guys. They, could, they looked into life. They could see the things of life. And they, they, they had a clue of what to do. That's a pretty big thing. Do you, are you a man or a woman of Issachar? Do you understand what's going on in the world around you? If not, ask God to open up your eyes. Okay, that's just, you know, a couple of them there. But the hereditary of that, of this woman, Leah, here, here's, here's her children, right? The king, uh, kingly tribe of Judah. You, now you, you caught that, that. So the kings of Judah come out of there. Oh, did you realize the priestly tribe of Levi comes out of Leah, the unfavored one? Think about this. Uh, and, and that makes her offspring. I, got, I just come, wow. Moses, David, and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God was at work. God was at work in this weak kind of woman who was weak-eyed, who was not favored, and not loved. And so, you know, to not be favored in, in this marriage, and, and there's you got four wives there, that means she probably felt like she was treated like dirt. Yeah. God doesn't forget. 
God just doesn't let all that happen to you and say, oops, I'm sorry, I, I looked over you, I didn't mean to do that. God doesn't say that. God says, I'm still working. And he said, at work in your life right now, you might not see it. You might not see his hand, you might not have his plan, but trust his heart, folks. Trust his heart. Jacob wasn't alone. God was working. And even though jo Jacob was the elect son, uh, he could not escape the consequences for his sin. You see, he had to experience the consequences to grow. If he didn't have to experience any consequences, you know, it's hard to grow. If you, I think not long ago, a, a very rich kid in Texas uh, got drunk and, and killed some other kids in, in a car accident. And he got off because of his parents' wealth. Now, he didn't get off because they paid the lawyers off. He got off because they were rich and he was immoral. He did not learn moral values because of their wealth. That is, baffles my mind. But see, he didn't have to pay the consequences for his sin, so he didn't learn. God wants you to learn from what's going on in your life. He wanted Chris Costa to learn what was going on in his life. And I, I paid a, a lot of cost for that. Hebrews 12, 5 and 6. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises the son he receives. So what happens if you don't receive discipline or chastising? You see, I don't think it's that God doesn't love you. I think it's that you don't know God that you haven't asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you're not in his life. God brought the deceiver uh, Laban into the life of, of uh, Jacob, man, so that this soon-to-be great patriarch of the tribe of Israel, who himself was a deceiver and a liar, so that Jacob might be brought to the forefront, uh, his sins brought to the forefront, that he might grow from that to become the man of God that he was meant to be. God allows us to go through. You know, if I, people say, man, don't you wish you could go back and not live the life you've lived? Uh, no, I, I never, I have never wished that. Well, yeah, but all that trouble you've been in and all the drugs and all the pain and all the, and you know what? That's the things I went through that made me the person I am today. And so when people call me with marriage problems and drug problems and life issues and uh, kids feel unloved, hey, uh, as a, uh, on the voice. Shelton does that weird thing. I was voted the most unlikely to succeed in my neighborhood. Let me tell you how that feels. It feels pretty horrible. Pretty horrible. My mother, when I got out of the Air Force, told my sister, your brother's a failure at life. And I thought, man, I finally made the right decision in life, and my mother thinks I'm a failure. And then when my mother came up and and was here and and seen me in the pulpit and uh, delivering God's word, she was totally amazed and, and was filled with joy because she seen that what God had been doing in my life. Man, don't don't give up on God, folks. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Last thing. Next to the last thing. It, it's been said by someone far smarter than me uh, that. Uh, it just may be that through them we take a long look at ourselves through the things of, uh, in our lives around us. It may be that some of those traits uh, characterize us and that other people may be put part of God's plan to discipline us. God, part of God's plan. And maybe, the th and Will, we were talking about this the other day, says, isn't it true that so often the thing you hate in other people is the thing you hate in yourself? Except you don't want to look at yourself, but you look at other people. And, and we miss what's going on in our own selves. One thing's for sure. God is working on behalf of each of you and on behalf of me. And he's working on the behalf of people in your life and in my life. He's working. They might not get the point, and I might not get the picture right now, but don't give up. 
Last thing, Hebrews six seventeen through 20. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he granted it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast Hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this sure and steadfast anchor. Man, be anchored in the Lord of our soul, a hope that enters into inner inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, have become our high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Man, anchor your soul in the word of God. Anchor it in the truth. God loves you. He loves you. Will you say that? Can you say that? Everybody say that. God loves me. God loves me. God loves you. And he loved me. And he, oh. <laughs> God loves you. Man, no matter what the world does, it cannot change the fact that Jesus hung on that cross to tell you he loves you and he forgives you. No matter what the world may say about you, no matter how the world might try to condemn you, God loves you, and he is working in your life. You might not see it today. I did not see it at 21 when I was sitting in that jail cell with that much water on the floor because they had a flood, and they, I was on, they put me on the top bunk. They didn't, wouldn't take me out of j- that jail cell and put me upstairs where there was no water. They, were, they didn't like me. <laughs> so I got pneumonia in jail. And, uh, you know, I, I think back to that. My dad said, if you ever get put in jail, I'm, don't call me. If you do the things that my, your family, your cousins have done, don't call me. So I called him, and he let me sit for a few more days. <laughs> Thank God he decided to bail me out, and, and God worked in my life. But uh, you know what? I, I have to look back and say, God, God never gave up. He heard that little boy's prayer that I wanted to know God when I was just a little guy. And although I didn't come to know him until I was 28 years old, God was still working in my life. He had a plan and a purpose. So I don't know what's going on in each life here. Some of us are facing medical issues. Some face, you know, trouble at home. Some face trouble at work. But God is working. Let's pray. Almighty God, hear our cries, our pleas of our heart. Hear our confusion. Lord, hear our uncertainties. And Father, Bring healing into our lives. Lord, if your people who are called by your name will turn from their wicked ways, Lord, turn from our our anger, our despise, our upset, our feeling forgotten and left alone. If we had turned from all those things to see you, to repent, to pray, you will bring healing into our lives. It says healing in our lands, but I, I, Lord, I can see that in our lives. So touch us, Lord. Touch us for your glory and for our peace that passes understanding. I don't know how you have heard God's word today. I hope that you heard him speaking and this didn't get caught up with me. But will you talk to him now? He wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your heart. Would you just take a few moments and pray? And if you don't know what to pray, say, Lord, I don't know what to pray. Lord, hear my heart. Know my heart. Know the pain, the the hurt, the upset, the confusion. Lord, know that. And Lord, teach me how to pray. Teach me how to talk to you, Lord. That's what it's all about. Will you take a moment to do that? And then John's going to, in a moment, going to start singing and welcome to join him. Oh, it's just a song of our heart to God. (laughs) 